Okay, these are our notes for chapter 12, DNA. What is DNA? DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. That's where we get the D, the N, and the A. So deoxyribonucleic acid. If you need to pause this video, you can do that if you need to catch up with your notes. So make sure you pause the video when you need to. DNA is the genetic material of cells. It contains genes. Genes are the units of genetic material that code for a specific trait. So when we talk about traits, we mean like hair color, eye color. So there are segments of DNA that code for specific traits. It might be the shape of your earlobe or how long your fingers are. It could be just about anything. DNA and RNA are made up of nucleic acids. And remember, nucleic acids are basically the, the building blocks of RNA and DNA. And it's one of the four macromolecules, nucleic acids. Remember, they have four macromolecules or biomolecules, nucleic acids, um, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins. DNA is made up of repeating molecules called nucleotides. And remember, a nucleotide contains a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. That, can, that would make up one nucleotide. So a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. The nitrogen base, there's four different ones. Remember, there was adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So DNA nucleotide, it has a phosphate group, a sugar, and the sugar for uh, DNA is deoxyribose. Remember that anything that ends in O-S-E is usually a sugar. And then it has a nitrogenous base, which could be A, C, T, or G. And this, so this would be one nucleotide, a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. The history of DNA. Discovery of the DNA double helix. In about 1928, Frederick Griffith discovers that a factor in diseased bacteria can transform harmless bacteria into deadly bacteria. So basically what he was showing was that DNA was the thing that carried this information from the harmless bacteria. Um, I'm sorry, it discovers that a factor in a diseased bacteria can transform harmless bacteria into deadly. So basically the DNA was taking the information from the deadly bacteria and putting it into the harmless bacteria. Rosalind Franklin, she took the first x-ray photo of DNA. 1952. And then Watson and Crick used their information plus the information from Rosalind Franklin to describe the structure of the DNA molecule. Without Rosalind Franklin, it probably would have taken them a lot longer. But Watson and Crick are credited with the discovery of the DNA molecule structure. And that was 1953. And that would be a picture of Frederick Griffith. That would be Rosalind Franklin. And that would be Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick. And their structure of DNA is right in the center there. Watson and Crick proposed DNA had specific pairing between the nitrogen bases, adenine and thymine, cytosine and guanine. Remember, it's always A, T, C, G. DNA was made of two long strands of nucleotides arranged in a specific uh, way called the complementary rule. The complementary rule, rule meaning 
that the number of A's always matched up with T's, the C's always matched up with G's. The DNA double helix. DNA has two strands and they're helical in nature, they're spiral. So there's two strands of them and they're helical. It's like a ladder and then we twist that ladder. I think I have an example somewhere. Let me check. Hold on. Hold on. So here's a model that somebody made. This is a DNA structure. If you look straight down the center, it's like a spiral. I think it's turning. And we have a bunch of, uh, let's see, these are sugars, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. So the, the styrofoam balls are sugars, the little wood balls are phosphates. And then the rungs across here would be this part, and that would be the uh, nitrogen basis, like ATCG. This is a good example. A good model. The legs of the ladder are the phosphate and sugar backbone. The rungs of the ladder are the nitrogenous bases, A, T, C, and G. So the way it would look is you would have a phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, on the other side, you would have sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And in the center, this is where you would have the nitrogenous bases. Here's C connecting with G, A connecting with T. Oops. And if you have this diagram to fill in, you can fill that in on your paper, or it might be done already. Purines, the two types of purines are adenine and guanine. Pyrimidines, thiamine and cytosine. The easiest way to remember this is that pyrimidine has a Y in it. Thiamine has a Y in it. Cytosine has a Y in it. So the pyrimidines are thiamine and cytosine. The purines, a little bit harder to remember, but it's just the opposite. Purines, there's a U in, in guanine, but uh, adenine, kind of hard to relate. Just remember the Y in pyrimidine, Y in thymine, Y in cytosine. Oops. Chargaff's rule. Adenine must pair with thymine. Guanine must pair with cytosine. So A, T, A, T, C, G, or G, C, same thing. Their amounts in a given DNA molecule will be about the same. So if you have, just for, for example, if you had 20 adenine, you would have 20 thymine. If you had 30 guanine, you'd have 30 cytosine. So that's basically Chargaff's rule that says that there's an equal amount of adenine, thymine, and then there's an equal amount of guanine and cytosine because they have to match up. AT. And CG. Base pairing. The base pairs between the C and the G and the A and the T are hydrogen bonds. So they're relatively weak bonds. Genetic diversity. Different arrangements of nucleotides in a nucleic acid provide the key to diversity among living organisms. So all living organisms have those same four nucleotides, A, T, C, and G, or nitrogenous bases, A, T, C, and G, and the order of them is what makes organisms different. So if we look at a family tree for the gray wolf, it came from this animal, which was an, an ancient ancestor of the gray wolf. And then from the gray wolf, we got dogs like sheepdogs, Samoy, uh, greyhounds, mastiffs, 
from Mastiffs, we got Newfoundlands. From Sheepdogs, we got Border Collies. So there's a lot of genetic diversity in dogs, but they're all genetically the same in terms of they pretty much, except for the coloring and the amount of fur and stuff like that, they're the same species. Birds. This is Australia, and it's showing the differences in, uh, I'm not sure what word that is, but the differences in that same species of bird and the coloring variations. Corn. Corn has different colors, like Indian corn has different colors. The code of life. The code of the chromosome is a specific order that bases occur. So if we had a strand of DNA that was A, T, C, G, T, A, T, G, C, G, G, DNA is wrapped tightly around histones and, coil and coiled tightly to form chromosomes. So there's six feet of DNA in each of your body cells. And in order to organize that, we have to uh, organize it around something to, so it doesn't um, get tangled and because we're going to need to unwind it. So if you think about it, it's like a cord. And the histone could be like this could be a histone. Whoops, there we go. This could be the histone. So what the, this is the DNA strain, we're going to store it. It's going to wrap around twice around the histone. And then it's going to go to another histone and wrap twice around the histone. So it's going to organize it into a more compact form rather than just having a cord. So you think about how your, your wired ear pods, your ear pods, how they get tangled. If you wrap them around something, they don't get tangled. DNA replication. DNA must be copied. In order to survive, your, your DNA has to duplicate. The DNA molecule produces two identical strands, complementary, two new complementary strands following the rules of the base pairs, AT and C and G. We're going to go through the details of this later. But each strand of the original DNA serves as a template for the new strand. So step one here. DNA is being pulled apart. Step two, new uh, base pairs are added. And then we get two strands of the same identical DNA. So there's a semi, that's called a semi-conservative model of DNA replication. Watson and Crick showed the two strands of the parental molecule. So you have one molecule, it separates. And they have two parental molecules, and each functions as a template for synthesis of a new complementary strand. So we have these two strands. They're each going to form a new strand. So if we look at this picture here, this one strand pulls apart. There's a new strand on each one. Therefore, it produces two identical strands as the first one. And this strand will do the same thing, pull apart produce two new identical strands. There's always this one original strand though. So the parental DNA, you have a DNA template, produces two DNA templates and a new strand of DNA on each of them. And we will stop there. So finish up your notes. If you need to go back, you can rewind the video.